Amen. All right, so the goal of the next four weeks uh, is to discuss what you could, what you may call hot cultural topics um, that directly affect uh, Christians in America, but around the world uh, today. Uh, I'm going to offer what I think to be a Christian perspective on the particular topic uh, and try to do so in such a way that if you were, if you held the other position, you would, you probably wouldn't end up, you you may end up agreeing. But you at least would be able to say, well, I guess that's reasonable. Um, now, we won't be able to dive into every little bit of that topic just because of time. But we will at least introduce the topic. And what I really want to do is to give you a, a foundation to think from, if that makes sense. Uh, so this is like a platform um, or a foundation so that you can continue your thinking on the topic that we'll be addressing. This time is political theology, is government. Uh, so let's dive into that. Uh, on your sheet uh, is a quote from John Philpot Curran, Irish, Irishman, lawyer, statesman. The condition upon which God hath given liberty to man is eternal vigilance, which condition if he break Servitude is at once the consequence of his crime and the punishment of his guilt. Have you ever heard that those who don't know history are doomed to repeat it? Mm -hmm. All right. Well, this is one of the reasons why this is important for Christians to think about. Uh, furthermore, uh, Christianity is inherently political. It's inherently political. What happened when the Son of God came flesh, was born, what happened right away? What was one of the first things to happen? You had a king say, he's a political threat to my reign. Let's kill all the babies. All the baby boys. See, from the get-go, Jesus is a threat to political figures. And therefore, from the get-go, Christianity is inherently political. Why? For, you know, ha, let's elaborate on that. Our, one of our fundamental professions as Christians is that Jesus is Lord. Jesus is King. Which flies in the face of tyrants. You see, when the church was going around saying Jesus is Lord, uh, what you were supposed to say at that time is Kaiser Kurios. You're supposed to say Caesar is Lord. Not Jesus is Lord. And, and that's why in Acts 17, you, you, have, uh, you have people saying that the apostles were disrupting the cities with their teachings. Uh, and they were teaching that there's another king, Jesus. The implication being, they're teaching that there's another king, a king that's not Caesar. <laughs> you see, this is a political threat to tyrants. And Christians from the get-go, as we will talk about, said... You cannot tell us who to worship or how to worship or to give you, Mr. King or Mr. Tyrant or whoever, worship. You can't. You have no authority here. So there you go. Christianity from the get-go was inherently political and therefore we have to think about it. It's the quick, the quick argument why this is important. So our, our outline today is first we're going to talk about sphere sovereignty. The second point is the Christian idea limited government. Three, America, the result of Christian political thought. And four, why socialism is not biblical, which is probably the most controversial point today, which if this was done 30 years ago, it would not have been a controversial point whatsoever, but that's the time that we live in. Uh, Proverbs 29.2, it's on the top of your sheet, and then we'll get started. When the righteous increase, the people rejoice. But when the wicked rule, the people groan. We don't want people to groan. <laughs> when people groan, people are suffering. Uh, and therefore it matters who our rulers are. It matters that the wicked do not rule. That does matter. And therefore, Christians, since we care about our neighbors, since we love people, uh, we should want righteous rulers. Not wicked ones. Seems obvious. But uh, so often we think, Politics and government are, is something that 
you know, is like a neutral zone that we get to push to the side. But um, Christ is, it, it, you know, Christ is Lord overall. In Matthew 28, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. And therefore, there's nothing that Jesus isn't Lord of. He is Lord of the state. He's Lord of America. He's Lord of everywhere. All right, sphere sovereignty. Let's talk about this. God, and we can come up with different spheres, but there's primarily three. Three spheres. Family. Church. State. Fear sovereignty means that God has given particular roles, particular authority. He's given authority to all three of these, but he's given a different type of role and authority to each. So the family, education, welfare, protection, etc. Church, word, and sacrament. State, bearing the sword, approving what is good. Justice. Right? So these are the three spheres, family, church, and state. And basically what, uh, what Christians have believed is that, um, yes, these do intermingle at times. Um, you can have a statesman who's a member at your church and has a family. And God's law is above all of these spheres. But you do not want the church intermingling in the state uh, to unnecessary to an unnecessary extent and you don't want vice versa you don't want the state saying it's saying you have to believe in transubstantiation right you, you don't want the state telling you what to uh, what to do in worship for example uh, you also don't want a family who says you elders don't have any authority over my children Right? So there's all these different, uh, these different issues that come up when you consider this. Uh, but to think about this further, let's go to Romans chapter 13. Romans chapter 13, which is Paul outlining God's role of civil government. Romans chapter 13. I always found it interesting that um, at the end of chapter 12, Paul tells the people, he says, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. And by the way, now let's talk about government. <laughs> that ushers us in into, uh, into the topic of government. Because Paul, Paul knows that governments go evil, and they're often evil. Uh, he knows this. So uh, he's laying out God's role of government here. Let's read. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God. And those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed. And those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval. For he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid. For he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is the servant of God, the avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Therefore, one must be in subjection, not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. For because of this, you also pay taxes. For the authorities are ministers of God attending to this very thing. Pay to all what is owed to them, taxes to whom taxes are owed, revenue to whom revenue is owed, respect to whom respect is owed, honor to whom honor is owed. So there we have Paul telling us, first, that as a Christian, you're not an anarchist. You believe that governments are ordained by God, and you're to respect them. Uh, also, he tells us the role of government. What is it? To bear the sword and to approve what is good. Um, that's their sphere. You don't want the church carrying out wars. Do you? That's not our sphere. 
Our weapons are not flesh and blood. Right? You don't want the church, I mean the state, mandating what to preach, for example. Okay? So that's fear, sovereignty. Uh, notice that Paul wrote this uh, in the mid-50s when Emperor Nero was in power. But this was before Emperor Nero really went crazy. This was actually a pretty peaceful time when he wrote this. Um, and, and also take note that Paul wrote this, uh, and at the same time, as we read all throughout the book of Acts, he was disobeying civil governments. He was. But he wasn't doing so flippantly. There was a time to do it and a time not to. So let's look, let's look to that issue real quick. He's not saying that you should always obey them. He's not saying, because he's not saying they have unlimited power. He limits their power. Uh, the Magdeburg Confession, which is a reform confession, written in 1550, which stands in the, in the um, tradition of Christian political thought in the West, states this very clearly. And this would be the general worldview of the reformers and the Puritans, etc. It says this. It's on your sheet. Let me give you a sheet. Yes. Do you, do you need a sheet? You're going to. Um, all right. The magistrate is an ordinance of God for honor to good works and a terror to evil works. Romans 13. Therefore, when he begins to be a terror to good works and honor to evil, there is no longer in him, because he does thus, the ordinance of God, but the ordinance of the devil. And he who resists such works does not resist the ordinance of God, but the ordinance of the devil. But he who resists, it is necessary that he resists in his own station as a matter of his calling. For example, Pastor Bob resisting um, an evil government would look differently than Governor DeSantis resisting. Because they have, they're in different spheres. You know, Gover Governor DeSantis... Uh, resisting uh, would be in a political way, you know, Pastor Bob in a spiritual preaching way. Uh, but it's necessary both would resist, right? But I, I, that, I highlighted that last statement because that is important. That is very important. But he who resists is necessary that he resists to his own station as a matter of his own calling. Uh, can someone read the Acts chapter 5 verse that's on your sheet for us? When they had brought them, they stood before the council. The high priest questioned them, saying, We gave you strict orders not to continue teaching in this name, and yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. But Peter and the apostles answered, We must obey God rather than men. Amen. So from the very beginning, Christians were saying, You, government, are limited. You don't have power here. We're going to obey God, not you, regardless of what you say. All right, the Christian idea of limited government and resistance. So <clears throat> this, um, basically the reasons Christians believe in limited government is because of this. It's because of this. The state is not over family and church. Cannot tell you, can't spank your kids. Cannot tell you anything of such, anything of the kind. Cannot tell the church what to preach. They, that's not their sphere. Okay, God gives to each sphere their own uh, authorities. So what is what is limited government? A government that doesn't step or overstep their God-given boundaries or their sphere of authority, but they stay in their sphere. God has given all mankind the rights of life, liberty. And property. Uh, said another way, you have the right of individuality. You have the right to be you. God made you you, and you can be you. He called you to a particular purpose. Uh, you have the right to use your God-given faculties, or the, the right to live out who God made you to be, and that's what God wants for you. And you have the right of pr uh, production, or to take dominion, as God told Adam in the garden, and to make stuff, and to have stuff, etc., uh, Frederick Bastier uh, states, he was a French economist in the 19th century, states this, Life, liberty, and property do 
do not exist because men have made laws. Now, note the contrary, it was the fact that life, liberty, and property existed beforehand that caused men to make laws in the first place. See, so life, liberty, and property existed prior, and that's what laws are founded on. So if the Bible teaches you have the right to defend your life, your property, and your liberty, then it follows that we have the right to set up a group of men who help protect the rights for the whole. This is called limited government. Notice the government is not for education, it's not for health care, it's not for food stamps. The government is to protect those God-given rights, and those are called negative rights. Those are called negative rights. Also notice that if it, what is true of one is true of the whole. Uh, so if, if God has given, given me rights, then God has given us all these rights. Uh, if I'm not allowed to oppress other persons' God-given rights, then the government's not allowed to oppress other people's God-given rights, unless God says, now you government have the right to do so, in, in, in the sense of someone murdering someone. Then God says very uh, clearly, they bear the sword. So you get to take away that person's rights, because they sought to take someone else's, or did take someone else, else's rights away. So, uh, so it's true of one, it's true of the whole. Uh, so the government is just a group of men. They are ordained by God, where they are just men who are called to protect the rights of all of the people. Um, and, and therefore, they're not somehow allowed to do something um, that I would not be allowed to do. I can't steal property from Rick, and therefore the government can't steal property from Rick. Pretty simple. Thou shalt not steal applies to the... I, I heard Walter Williams, a, a famous economist, you might have heard his name, say this once, and um, it was really striking. He said, some politicians forget that thou shalt not steal applies to them as well. <laughs> um, and that is accurate. <laughs> it does apply to them, because it applies to me. God, it's God's moral law. It applies to everyone, in every sphere. And a government isn't this magical entity. It's just a group of men helping to protect the rights of everyone else. Um, it's a you know pretty pretty basic but really really important and we seem to forget it and and people a lot of people do not believe this today. This might seem this might seem normal for us. This is not the norm. People aren't believing this at all. They believe more so in an unlimited government, uh, which is which is very very dangerous. Um, all right, why should Christians believe in limited limited government? I, I put three points on your sheet, and you can write them in, but I actually have four. I actually have four. Uh, so the first is sphere sovereignty. God did not delegate everything to the state, what were we first talked about. Not everything is delegated to the state. Okay, Paul outlines in Romans 13, this is the role of government. Okay. Even in ancient Israel, there was a separation of church and state. Okay? The Levites and the priests could not do everything. They did not bear the sword, right? And God judged some of the kings for doing priestly acts. You remember that? Right, right. So, so even then, so from the get-go, God is outlining these, these differences. Okay. So, sphere sovereignty. Second, because the church made this argument from the very beginning. Literally from the inception of the church. The argument was made by the apostles that we are not going to follow you. We're not going to obey you. We're going to obey God. He is the king. Jesus is the ruler. Um, they made this argument from the get-go. Um, before that, the government in, in basically every culture had the right of... Uh, they, they basically were over both of these. Every sphere of life. Um, they controlled religion in every aspect. The king was often seen as a deity that you had to worship. And Christianity came along and said, no, <laughs> no. I, I'm not going to go that way. Um, I'm called to respect you. I'm not an anarchist. I want to, leave a, I want to live a peaceable, quiet life, dignified. I want to work with my hands. You know, I just want to live for God, but I'm not going to do this stuff that you. I'm not going to worship you. I'm not going to say Caesar is Lord. I'm not going to do the pinch, pinch the incense at the altar and bow the knee. 
Um, none of that. I, I, I'll, I'll be a good citizen. Yeah. But I'm not going to do any of that stuff that, that contradicts what God has clearly told me to do or not do. Nick, it's interesting that uh, as the church grew in power, it, it was flipped where the papacy had more power than the state. Mm -hmm. And uh, they would literally decide who was who would be in power, who would be recognized. Uh, something that they had to fight against mm -hmm. early on. And then... Yeah, it, yeah, it's quite a complicated history. Um, so, so this... So this, what we're talking about here, the limited government idea, um, was clearly in the early church. It clearly was in Augustine. Um, but Augustine wasn't um, consistent. He wanted, the, he wanted the state to persecute heretics. Okay? Um, so there was kind of these two streams. Um, the, the third point, which, which I'll say, because it's, it's, it's consistent with, this, with your question or your statement, um, it, the third is the doctrine of original sin. So uh, Augustine really pointed that out. Is, is because of the doctrine of original sin, governments need to be limited. Um, but also in the, same, in the same breath, Augustine said, let's, let's, persecute, let's, um, let's persecute the Donatists, um, a religious group. Long story. Uh, maybe a Bible study on that another time. His, history lesson another time. But, um, so he was inconsistent, and there was all these different streams of, of thought on that. And, and over time, yeah, the state and the church got intermingled. Um, but really what ended up happening at the time of the Reformation is the limited government argument won out. What do you have with Martin Luther? I say, yeah, no. You know, I'm not, this is all wrong. He challenged it completely um, and fought against that. And the reformers in the early days still had to... They still had a bit of that church and state issues, but eventually what won out, as is our next point, is the limited government argument, um, as we see in, in America. So, that's good news. Fourth, uh, Jesus is king of the state. So we should believe in limited government because it's a sphere of sovereignty. The church has made this argument from the very beginning, and the and. It's consistent. You can find this argument through the history of the church in the West all the way through from Augustine and all the way through uh, the Reformers. Three, original sin. Okay? If you believe in original sin, you believe in total depravity, you do not want an unlimited state. But if, if, you, if you believe that human hearts are corrupt, why in the world would you delegate your compassion to the state. Why would you say, yeah, I want you to take 80% of my earnings and then distribute it out to everyone else? Because you, you, you're so wise. You know how I should be compassionate to others. You, you know exactly you know, how the poor should be treated. So let me give you that power. Uh, that, that doesn't seem consistent with the doctrine of original sin. In any way, shape, or form. Also, Jesus is king. So if Jesus is king, if he's their true king overall, then the government has to be limited in power. Because he's the only one with unlimited power. He said, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Were you going to say something? Okay. Um, all right. We, we have begun to lose this. We've begun to lose this. As, as you probably already thought in your... In your head, we could point to things like the welfare state, the increasing regulations, uh, the creation of the Department of Education. Uh, it, once the government starts to mingle in the affairs of the people, uh, and the people don't do anything about it, as the first quote we read, it slowly grows out of control, and it's getting worse and worse and worse. Here's just one example. Just one. There's lots of examples. But the New Jersey governor, Phil Murphy, had Jews arrested for attending synagogue during these COVID days while liquor stores remained open, etc. Uh, and then when questioned about it, about if it was consistent with the Bill of Rights, or if he looked to the Bill of Rights before he made the decision, he said the Bill of Rights was above his pay grade and he wasn't thinking about the real Bill of Rights when he did this. That's a, that's a quote. That's what he said. So, <laughs> increasingly, um, Politicians do not have the worldview of the founders. They do not have a worldview of limited government. 
whatsoever, in any way, shape, or form. Um, and therefore, they, they don't really care about the Constitution or the Bill of Rights, which is, which is scary. All right, America. Point three, the result of Christian political thought. Here's a quote from historian Glenn Sunshine. The founding documents of the United States, the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution, were the culmination and the highest expression of a long evolution of political thought among Christian thinkers going back to the early church. The Declaration of Independence, as, as uh, Thomas Jefferson said, is a summing up of the American mind. So I think in the Declaration of Independence, you actually will find um, a summary of the, of the biblical idea of limited government and how it progressed, because thoughts get bigger and they progress and then become more complex. Um, so let's go ahead. I don't have it on my sheet, but I have it on yours. Let me grab the sheet. So let's go ahead and read a little bit of it. I, I found this, you know, I was thinking about this this summer, about every time I ask someone if they read the Declaration of Independence, they, they either say no with like a shock look in the face, like, how could I have never read that? Uh, or, uh, yeah, in school once. I typically never get, yeah, I, you know, I read it once a year, or I, or I know it pretty well, or I've studied it, or something like that. Um, so let's go, ahead and, let's go ahead and read it. In Congress, July 4th, and this is, this is not holding, this is a, this is a portion of it, but in Congress, July 4th, 1776, the unanimous declaration of the 13 United States of America, when in the course of human events, it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with one another, with another, and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and nature's God entitled them, a decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to the separation. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. That whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or to abolish it, and to institute new government, laying its foundation on such principles and organizing its powers in such form as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. Prudence indeed will dictate that governments long established should not be changed for light and transient causes. And accordingly, all experience hath shown that mankind are more disposed to suffer while, ever, while evils are sufferable than to right themselves by abolishing the forms to which they are accustomed. But when a long train of abuses and usurpations pursuing invariably the same object evinces a design to reduce them under absolute despotism, it is their right, it is their duty to throw off such government and to provide new guards for their future security. You know, sometimes we think that they were very flippant in this. They were, you know, just a bunch of wild, you know, revolutionaries. They were like, you know, let's just do this. No, <laughs> let's just, let's go to war. No, they were very, very thoughtful, and they knew if we were to do this, if we're, if we're going to resist this tyranny, we, it better be tyranny. Right? It, it better be pleasing to God that we do this. It better be, or he's not going to bless it. He's not going to bless it at all. If this isn't defensive, if this isn't pleasing in his sight, if this is offensive anarchy rebellion, it's not going to go very well. They, they definitely understood understood this. Uh, so that right there really sums up the idea of limited government and resistance. When is it okay to resist? When is it not okay? Um, what's the role of government? You know, it does it ever overreach? Is it unlimited? Well, no. It's, it's not. Um, now, if, you know, a lot, of, a lot of the time what comes up when that's read is slavery. And rightly so, it's a it's a good discussion. We are just to just to let you know, we will discuss that next week uh, when we're talking about uh, race, racism, race relations, justice, and things of that kind. So that will be addressed next week um, for sure. But what most people miss about the War of Independence, which I'll just touch on briefly, 
Um, it, 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 imagine this. This is the best analogy that I've heard. Imagine that Rhode Island sent you a tax bill. It came from their legislature. What would you do? You wouldn't pay it. That's what you would do. They have no authority. Rhode Island has zero authority. So if someone doesn't have authority over you, you don't pay it. You, 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 don't, you don't have to obey that. They don't have authority over you. It's like a thief coming in in the middle of the night saying, give me all your stuff. Well, you're required by God to protect your family and say, no, get, get out. I, I'm going to resist that you know, um, and, and, and protect. Um, so that's probably the best uh, uh, analogy. Through a number of historical situations and circumstances, English Parliament became more and more powerful, uh, even than the king at the time. Uh, and the colonies already had their own legislatures. And, and they were connected to the king. Um, some were connected to the king, but in varying degrees. But none of them were really had any connection to English Parliament, who grew in power. Uh, they weren't represented in Parliament. They, they had their own legislatures in the colonies. And this is where you get no taxation without representation. They already had their own legislatures. So then you have, then you have these people um, without authority commanding them to do stuff. Um, and, 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 and by the way, it wasn't just taxes. If you continue reading through the Declaration of Independence, they list, there's a long list of, of reasons why they are saying this is unjust tyranny and we're going to resist this. A long list of things that the king has did at the time. Um, and that's why, uh, like what we just read, when there is a long list of abuses and usurpations, well, then you've got to do something about this and protect your freedoms. So, that's my quick argument to say the War of Independence was a just war, I believe. There's good arguments to believe so um, because of the doctrine of limited government. All right, let's dive into this very quickly. Why socialism is not biblical. Why socialism is not biblical. So, let's start with this. You know by now that limited government is a Christian idea. It's rooted in the doctrine of original sin. And therefore, since socialism by definition gives the government unlimited power where they can mingle in all the affairs of the people and enter into spheres they have no business being in according to God, it's unbiblical. That's basically it. <laughs> That's basically the argument. Frederick Bastier, uh, he's very helpful here. And I recommend his book called The Law. Frederick Bastier's book called The Law. Um, very good book. Here I encounter the most popular fallacy of our times. This is the 19th century. Long time. It is not considered sufficient that the law should be just. It must be philanthropic. Nor is it sufficient that the law should guarantee to every citizen the free and inoffensive use of his faculties for physical, intellectual, and moral self-improvement. Instead, it is demanded that the law should directly extend welfare, education, and morality throughout the nation. This is the seductive lore of socialism. There you have it. For the government to extend its reach into all these other domains... It would by necessity create a system of injustice because law is force. This is what he goes on to argue. Law is force. So when you're forcing some uh, things to take place in the society with the cry of equality, for example, trying to make everything equal for everyone, you're by, uh, by definition creating a system of injustice. What the, what the Bible wants, what God wants, is the law to be a negative force. The law to be a negative force. Uh, in other words, the law is supposed to simply defend equally the rights of all. It's to defend equally the rights of all. When it starts to enter into other domains, it actually ends up plundering the goods of the people. And it does so, quote-unquote, legally. But legal plunder, legal plunder, is still plunder. Nonetheless, so just call it just because you call just because you call abortion health care and you legalize it doesn't mean that it's lawful. Doesn't mean that it's good. Doesn't mean that it's right. Just because you call socialism good and, and compassionate 
doesn't make it good in compassion. It's actually just plunder. It's, it's, it's setting up a system of greed to where if you have a good amount of stuff, then that definitely means that you oppress someone else. So I should take that from you and spread it. Um, but that's a zero-sum game. Economics which just is not the case. Right? Um, it, simply because someone has a lot of stuff and is rich does not ne necessitate that they oppress someone else. That's a false assumption that they always start with. But it's just not, not true. If, if people, if you want freedom, if you want freedom, and you want limited government, what you have to want is a free market. That's what you want. Basically all that is, is Blair has something I want, I have something he wants. I go to him, I hand it to him, and he gives it to me freely, and the government doesn't interfere in that transaction. That's all, that's all that is. If you have, if you have socialism, um, they're restricting that, and they're regulating that, um, to the, to the nth degree. Uh, free market is freedom. And when you give freedom to someone who is enslaved to the devil, they will use that earthly freedom to do their father's will. So free markets, and bad things happen in free market societies, but freedom is good. You don't get rid of the freedom. <laughs> if, if, if there's greedy people in a free market society, right, which there, there is, uh, that doesn't mean that the answer is socialism. If the answer is the gospel. You, that man needs to repent of his greed. And he needs to turn to Jesus and stop being unjust in his business practices. Um, so, so in Amos, for example, when you had this rich ruling class oppressing the people, God, God um, uh, speaks words of judgment to them. And his word of judgment is repent or I'm going to come and destroy you. He never says, well, let's set up this system. Right? Where, where there's going to be governors who take away your wealth and s distribute it among uh, the people. So, it, let's finish with this. Crony capitalism is, is bad. It is bad. Where the government and big business um, kind of get together uh, and they give each other, um, they give each other all these, you know, the, big, the government gives each other, uh, give the, gives the big business lots of breaks. Um, that's not good. Uh, either. But no one's arguing for that today. The argument today is socialism, so that's what we have to talk about. You have football players like Colin Kaepernick wearing Fidel Castro t-shirts on television, um, <laughs> which is uh, Cubans don't like that very much. Um, so, uh, so it's the end thing, and all the kids are buying into it. They are. I mean, it's just all the kids are buying into it um, because they think it's compassionate. Um, and they take their freedoms for granted. And, and, and you know, freedom means hard work and responsibility. Uh, and people don't like that either. Uh, so if you get lazy and the government comes in, if you have a lazy society and the government comes in, here's the free stuff. Free stuff. Oh, he's giving me free stuff and that candidate's not. Okay, that one. But uh, they don't know the simple truth that, you know, nothing is free. <laughs> it's going to come, it's going to come at a price. Uh, and, you, and you don't want that. You definitely do not want that price. Uh, we don't want a group of men telling us what we can do with our time, our money, our effort. Only God can do that. So for people who know uh, God, uh, what God ordained government for, for people who know history, uh, even a little bit, and 20th century history uh, in particular, and care about freedom, they just, you cannot accept any form of socialism, period. Um, is there a problem with our system of economics? Yes, but socialism is not the answer. More government regulation is not the answer. The gospel is the answer. We want freedom, period. We don't want the government mingling into our affairs and leave these two branches to deal with the, to deal with the issues. What happens is the church ends up having problems, the family ends up having problems, and the government says, ooh, we can help. And then it causes even more problems. You don't want, you don't want this to get worse, because then it causes more problems in these two spheres. Um, you, you, you want the spheres to deal with themselves over time, and it happens through repentance. All right, Milton Freeman. The only societies in recorded history in which people have been able to rise out of poverty are capitalist societies with largely 
free trade. The worldview that socialism is rooted and grounded in led to the deaths of millions of people in the 20th century. So it's not, it's not a neutral thing to accept the ideology. It's not an okay thing to accept the ideology. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a bad thing. The last quote I'm going to read uh, from Glenn Sunshine here. We cannot rely on government to deal with our sin. Because government itself is subject to sin and is ill-equipped to solve social problems outside its proper purview, outside of its sphere. Instead, we need to use the tools of the city of God, love, compassion, mercy, self-sacrifice, confession, penitence, and the like, to identify sin in ourselves and in our institutions and to work toward renewing them and restoring them to their proper functions under God. This won't solve all of our problems, of course, but it's where we need to start. There you go. When socialists say, you know, give this utopian vision, where if you give them more and more and more power, everything's going to be okay. You just say, yeah, no, that's the biggest lie I've ever heard in my life, and I do not believe you. Plain and simple. Reject it. It's not true. It's not going to happen. Be because we believe in original sin. You see, the, the answer is not government. The answer is the tools of the city of God, as Glenn Sunshine pointed out. But that won't even solve all of our problems. Because we're on this side of eternity. All right. Questions? I know there was a lot. I had, I, I had a very hard time organizing this. Because <laughs> there was so much to talk about. Go ahead. Have you, have you ever heard the, the parable of the two cows... You describe different political views. You have two cows under socialism. The government comes, takes one, gives it to your neighbor. Communism, the government takes both and gives you some milk. Mm -hmm. Fascism, the government takes both and, both and sells you milk. Nazism, they take both kills, cows and shoot you. And with capitalism, you sell one of the cows and buy a bull. And it really sums it up in a that's good. I've never heard that. I've never heard that. That's good. You know, it's from, from being forced, compelled to do something, mm -hmm. to doing something willingly that really benefits you and, and others. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you know, one, one more thing um, to add to that. I, um, it is very interesting if you notice people who buy into the idea of socialism. Uh, one of the things that is very clear when they're talking about things is that they hate Christianity's influence on the West. They hate it. They despise any, any resemblance of Christianity, any, any, anything Christian, anything Christian that has influenced the West. They hate it. They do not like Western civilization. And, and here's why we're talking about a worldview series class, is because that's because of their worldview. They, they don't believe in Western values or they, they, they're not Christians. Um, and so that affects the way they view everything else. Well, Nick, you mentioned original sin, and if you ask most people, they will tell you that people are basically good. And when you start there, mm -hmm. you're just going to be way off. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and, and last week we talked about common grace and, and how um, we should be careful with, with expanding that doctrine too far. And a lot in the church today have done that to the to the point where they will trust the government. Um, with you know, if, if you know, they will trust socialists basically, who say, you know, we should you know trust us basically, and and we'll we'll deal with your money fairly, and we'll do what's best with, with your money for you. Um, and and there's a lot of Christians who are buying into that. There's a lot of Christians, even in our denomination, that are buying into that idea. Um, and that's an it's ignoring the doctrine of original sin. It's, it's naive. Anything else? All right. Next week we're going to talk about uh, social justice, uh, race, 